My name is George Shelby. Welcome to the step one video, playing the penny whistle. You've made a great choice in the penny whistle because it's a very easy instrument to learn and will give you a lot of musical enjoyment. So let's get started. First thing we're going to talk about is music notation. Although a thorough explanation of standard music notation is beyond the scope of this book, rest assured that any symbols peculiar to music written for the penny whistle will be explained as they occur. In fact, the exercises and tunes are all presented in such a way that you do not really have to know too much about reading music to jump right in. If you go right through from beginning to end, the sharpening of your music reading skills will be a valuable byproduct of learning to play the penny whistle. Now let's talk about tablature. Tablature is a system of notation for a specific instrument that graphically conveys the mechanics of playing the right notes. While standard notation tells you what pitches to play, tablature tells you how to place your fingers to produce them. The tablature system used in this book and video is simply a picture of six holes as they would appear to you if you were looking in a mirror. If a circle is open, then the corresponding hole on the whistle is uncovered. If a circle is filled, then the corresponding hole is covered by the correct finger. Tablature is a concise way to convey penny whistle fingerings. However, keep in mind that your goal should always be to relate the standard music notation directly to the fingerings. In this way, you'll soon be able to read music printed in books other than this one. Throughout this video, I'll be going back and forth and using different penny whistles. They are basically pitched the same, and the holes are the same, but one may give you a clear indication of where fingerings are. And the other may just have a different tone for you to hear. Whichever penny whistle you have, make sure that it works properly for you. Okay, let's get started. Hold the penny whistle in your left hand so that your index, middle, and ring fingers cover the top three holes. Your fingers should be straight and relaxed as opposed to arched, so that each hole is effectively sealed by the fleshy pad of the finger, as opposed to the fingertip. In this way, you will find that you need not apply undue pressure to close the holes. Your hand may remain relatively relaxed. This is very important since any tenseness will inhibit the natural agility of your fingers. Placement of the thumb varies from player to player. Try shifting your thumb up and down the back of the whistle until you find a position that feels natural and well balanced. If no one position feels best, try placing your thumb directly opposite your middle finger or just slightly higher. Now you're ready to play. Place the mouthpiece between your lips. Keep your mouth and jaw in a relaxed, natural, closed position. Your teeth should be parted slightly, about the same as for normal speech. Don't let the mouthpiece touch your teeth. Relaxation is the key. If your lips, jaws, fingers, or any other part of your body is tense, your music will also be tense. Next, whisper the syllable two and hold a steady stream of breath, covering all three fingers over these three holes, like this. If you hear squeaks or if the pitch wavers, Check to make sure that all three fingers are covering the holes completely. Also, make sure that you are not overblowing. Let me give you an example of that. Experiment with the different amounts of air pressure until you find the correct amount to produce a steady, pure tone. The skill of breath control will soon become second nature. Here are two more notes, A and B. A is simply covering the two holes with index and middle finger. And B is simply covering just the index finger. Now I'm taking my fingers completely off the penny whistle to give you a clear example. When you're playing, you want to keep your fingers as close as possible to the holes without actually covering them. So here would be an example of playing B, A, and G. Now you try stringing all three notes together by going up and down, smoothly, slowly, and evenly. 
practice this little exercise two ways. First, tonguing, which is whispering two. Your tongue should be striking the top part of your mouth. Then try tonguing each note. If you blow without tonguing, now you're doing what's called slurring. In notated music, slurs are indicated by a curved line that connects the two notes or includes a group of three or more notes. In playing penny whistle, slurring and tonguing are basic methods of what's called phrasing. Slurring a group of notes together tends to link them, while tonguing each note gives a more detached impression. Let me give you an example. That would be a slurred phrase. We're ready to try our first song, first jig. In first jig, be sure to follow the phrase marks and tongue only the first note of each phrase. Now we're ready to bring our right hand into play. Hold the whistle as if to play G. Position your right hand with the index, middle, and ring fingers directly above the bottom three holes. Play G, then bring your right hand fingers down one at a time, and you'll be playing F sharp, E, and D. Since the penny whistle is in the key of D major, the notes in its basic scale are those of the D major scale. D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, and then D above that. Notice that you have to blow slightly lighter for these lower notes. It's easy to overblow E and D, causing them to pop up an octave. However, be careful not to blow too lightly or the pitch will start to waver. Once again, practice the new notes slowly, evenly, and smoothly, and the proper breath control will soon become automatic. Now it's time for our first waltz. This little waltz uses all of the notes that you've been introduced to thus far. One thing that might give you some trouble at first is coordinating your fingers in passages where the progression of notes is not scale-wise. One of these places is right in the first measure, G to E. Practice going back and forth between G and E until your right hand index and middle finger move as one. Other places that it would not hurt to practice in this manner are measure 7, where it goes from B to G to E, and measure 13, E to B. As you play this piece, Keep in mind that it's important to keep each finger close to its respective hole. Resist the temptation to let your fingers flap about flamboyantly. Relax, keep each movement small and precise. This will make it easy to play any tune smoothly. Our next tune introduces a new aspect of articulation called double tonguing. This may sound pretty fancy, but it's simply a very natural way of tonguing repeated notes that would otherwise be difficult to play at a faster tempo. Playing a string of eighth notes, 
but instead of tonguing each one with a whispered two, alternate between two and ku. Start slowly and gradually speed up until your tongue is just slightly flicking the steady stream of air. Now we're ready to play First March, which has some of the double-tonguing techniques in it. Let's talk about the higher octave of the penny whistle. The higher octave of the whistle is fingered the same as the one that you already know. The only difference is that you must blow a little harder to get the notes to pop out. In your book is a scale in octaves. Notice the difference in pressure that is required to produce the high octave. Don't worry if the high C sharp and D sound rather shrill. They always do. To really get down your control of the high octave, play these exercises as smoothly as possible taking careful note of the slurs. I'll play an example for you now of octaves starting on low D. Little tip for you to keep in mind is that as you're playing the upper octave, it helps if you tilt the penny whistle slightly down to get that upper octave to sing out a little bit. So here we go from low D. talk about ornamentation. Grace notes are an important element of traditional whistle playing. These are notes that are printed smaller than regular notes and are not really part of the melody, but rather serve to ornament it. Because of this, they are just sort of stuck in, theoretically take up no time value at all. Actually, they exist by grace of the note that they follow. That is that they are played very quickly, just before the note that they ornament. Grace notes and other more intricate ornaments are an important part of traditional Irish whistle playing. Much of the ornamentation is derived from bagpipe playing and is used to articulate repeated notes without tonguing. Tonguing is obviously impossible on any type of bagpipe. In fact, due to the similarity in fingering, the penny whistle is often used as a considerably quieter preliminary or alternative to the Highland or Eulian pipes. Here's an example of ornamentation. We'll take three F sharps, which we'll just tongue individually. Now try quickly flicking your right hand index finger up and down instead of tonguing the notes. You can also use a grace note from below by flicking your right hand middle finger down and up. Probably the most common type of grace note is what a bagpiper would call a cut. For this one, you leave the lowest finger in place and flick one of the fingers above it, up or down. Combining the upper and lower grace notes give you what whistle players refer to as a roll. Try this next phrase, which ends with a combination of grace notes and a roll. Play it all in one breath 
And notice how much more interesting it sounds than if you were just to tongue the repeated notes. True ornamentation is a matter of personal style and preference. Try to listen to good penny whistle players on record or in person. Once you have an idea of what they are doing, you can incorporate any of their tricks or techniques into your own playing. You'll find that a good player will change a tune to insert his or her own twists and turns. Some may use virtuosically florid triplet runs. Others may use teasing, rippling sequences of double cut grace notes. Still others may play it straight. In the tunes that follow, the ornamentation is purposely simple. When first learning a tune, it's often advisable to leave out the grace note figures until you are able to begin to bring the tune up to speed. When you're ready to insert the ornaments, be sure to follow the fingerings given. More often than not, these will sound rather strange if played slowly. Isolate problem spots and work on them until you fully understand how each ornament fits in. Time now to embark on some genuine music. If you're fairly confident with the material so far, you'll have no trouble with this batch of tunes. Most of them were chosen because we happen to like them, but you can learn something from each and every one of them. There will be new techniques and tricks introduced in each one of them, so it's probably a good idea to start at the beginning and read right through them. Enjoy. Our first tune is called Dargasan, a simple English country dance tune that may be so much fun to play because it never seems to end. The chord symbols under the music are for guitar, piano, or any other backup instrument. Since most of these tunes can be harmonized in more than one way, you'll usually find alternate chord changes in parentheses or written underneath the primary changes. There are two new phrasing techniques employed in this next tune. The first occurs in measure five, where you will see a dot above the B. This indicates that the note should be played staccato. Give it less than its full value, and thus detach it from the following G. Let me give you the example. Those would be staccato notes. The other new technique is a slide from the E in measure 14 to the F sharp in measure 15. Instead of lifting your right hand middle finger decisively as you would normally do, let it roll off the hole gradually, causing the pitch to bend up to the F sharp. Although many would not consider staccato notes and slides to be techniques of phrasing, they do emphasize certain notes and contribute to the cohesiveness of phrasing of the tune in general. Fool's Jig is an English Morris dance tune used to accompany intricate solo dance involving the adroit and somewhat hazardous manipulation of a large stick between the dancer's legs. Play it with an up-tempo, almost humorous feel, but not too fast.
Our next song is Old Mother Oxford. This is another English Morris dance which takes the form of a lighthearted march. Another new phrasing indication appears at the beginning of the B section. From measure 17 on, you will see dashes above and below some of the note heads. These indicate that you should play these notes with a pressure accent. The feel is similar to staccato and that the main distinction that you should give these notes is detachment from the notes immediately following. However, the pressure accent, also called marcato, calls for a little extra stress on the affected note. Since the last four measures of the A and B sections are identical, we've added a little extra ornamentation the second time around. Our next song, Rondeau, is from the first suite to symphonies by Jean-Joseph Moray, published in 1729. These days, it is most certainly better known as theme from Masterpiece Theater. It is a fairly straightforward tune. The only tricky part is the high D in measure five. There is also a DC al fine, which means to go back to the beginning and play the tune until you reach the word fine, in this case, measure 16. Our next song is My Lodgings on the Cold Ground. This waltz is also known by the name All Those Endearing Young Charms, after the song of the same title. There are two new fingerings for a new note, C natural. The first C natural occurs in measure three. That's fingering for C natural. The fingering for the B that follows in measure five greatly facilitates an otherwise awkward change. To execute the grace note C natural in measure six, I've suggested using a half hole fingering. Simply uncover the top hole halfway as if you were going to slide up to the C sharp. So instead of having it covered or uncovered, you roll it halfway up. Notice that in measure 25, which is a repeat of measure one, the roll takes the place of the eighth note.
The Nutting Girl. A major is an unusual key for the D penny whistle because it necessitates the use of the note G sharp. When you must play a note that is not part of the D major scale, you can always find it by half holing. However, it is often advisable to use the indicated alternate fingerings for G sharp in up tempo tunes such as the Nutting Girl. These fingerings may sound a bit out of tune, but they give a more definite impression than half hole fingerings, which are decidedly difficult to hit square on. Here's an example. Here's A. The half hole fingering for G sharp would be to take your ring finger and half cover this hole, or the alternate fingering would be to play A and cover these three lower holes for the G sharp. Practice both, do what comes easiest for you. The song Kevin Berry is a wonderfully melodramatic slow air. The song tells a sad, dignified story, and the tune should be played in a similar manner. There is a new technique here that proves very effective in slow tunes. It is a type of vibrato that is obtained by rapidly covering and uncovering on one of the open holes that is two or three holes below the lowest note covered for the given note. This produces a variation in timbre, but not in pitch. This vibrato works better for some notes than others and is generally called on for only long held notes near the end of phrases. It is indicated in music by the abbreviation VIB. The extra fingering diagram tells you which finger performs the vibrato. Here's an example. Now let's play Kevin Berry. Thanks for spending time with us learning how to play the penny whistle. Be patient, take your time, but you'll find that you'll make rapid progress with this wonderful instrument. We hope to see you again real soon. Mm -hmm.